Hello everyone, Busy Gamer Dad, breaking down and debunking difficulty. I got a request to try and do this, so I'm going to see how uh, this goes. So what I'm showing you here is Final Fantasy 1 Pixel Remastered. I'm going to talk with you about our gameplay for the this game, and I'm going to talk about is it difficult, is it not difficult, if there are any changes for the game, and is this game right for you and my recommendation on that. So the game has six classes in total. You have the Fighter, Thief, Black Belt, Red Mage, White Mage, and Black Mage. I kept the party to my nostalgia factor, where I had the Fighter, I had the Thief, I had the White Mage, and I had the Black Mage. In this game, there's no special utilities other than the equipment that they can use. The Thief can't steal, the White Mage doesn't get any crazy new bonuses or anything like that. Uh, the Fighter does get a fair bit of equipment selection. The Black Belt is a physical powerhouse damage monster later in the game. And the Red Mage is a bit of a hybrid between the caster classes and the uh, melee warrior classes. As far as the game itself goes, it plays great. If you're looking for a 10 second answer to try it out, try it out. It's not a bad game, especially this version of it. I know that there's a lot of boosting and utilities that you can get into the game where you can remove the encounters, reduce the encounters, make your gold better, make your experience better, or worse if you're looking to challenge yourself. The story arc of the game is not changed at all. They have added a lot of wonderful new little cutscenes and little uh, graphics to the overall game itself to make it more immersive and make the story more fleshed out. And I can't say uh, with enough words that that's a breath of fresh air for me. The game has been reskinned and redesigned so many times on various different consoles and various different systems that it's old hat for them to do that. And I think that they did a really good job with this game. That said, there is a glaring thing if you do get the Steam version of the game, and that's the font. The font has been a point of contention for a lot of people who have picked up this game, but that's by no means a deal breaker or a game breaker. It's the font. You can get a mod and put it onto the game and change it to whatever you want it to be. It's up to you and your decision on that. I played through with it being the standard stock game, and I didn't find it too jarring or too awful to play. As far as anything else goes, where I had any difficulties or glitches or problems, didn't have any whatsoever. I rescued the Princess Sarah from Garland out of the gate. I got the boat from uh, Bicky from uh, Provoca, and I did all the errand running that the tutorial section in Cornelia's little ocean peninsula area has me do, running down to fight the wizards in the marsh cave to pick up the uh, crown to bring to Aztos to see if I can see get the cure for the sleeping dark elf prince and turns out no he's a bad guy he's a dark elf and he says that he's going to take over the kingdom with the crown from there I traveled all around the peninsula picking up all the various treasures and loots and rewards so that I could end my game on a high note where I could be overpowered early on and have that be a cascading benefit throughout the rest of the game that I played. You run to the Lich and fight him in the Earth Cave where the life spell is very integral for the NES version of the game, but it's very much limited impact in this type of game here, because you can buy Phoenix Downs from any of the item shops. That quality of life change, improvement, I have mixed feelings about personally, because it does marginalize the life spell and does create an area where the player gets money hand over fist and very easily can buy any number of curatives and restoratives for themselves and marginalize a lot of the extensive dungeon delving that this game really showcased in the NES era or in the previous iterations of the game where that was not an option. At the end of the day, you want to have that challenge. You play a game sometimes to be challenged, and if you're not getting challenged, then that's fine if that's what you want. But from my stance, like I said, I have slightly mixed feelings about the inclusion of those high-level curatives and restoratives as a supplemental benefit, as also a handicap to the overall difficulty of the game. 
as far as the spells go, they're impactful. They kept the traditional system where you have a limited number of slots and each level you can only have three spells in those slots and you can only cast them up to nine times. Again though, however, they included ethers into this game where you can restore your magic points. Another nuance that I have, again, mixed feelings about, I certainly use them, I'm not going to be hypocritical about it, but did I feel they, again, marginalized or changed the idea that the game should be more challenging? Yes, I do. Was it a good quality of life improvement or change? Yes, it was. Because I didn't have to buy them if I didn't want to. I also liked how they improved the item system in this game to have most of the broken items and broken contexts work. However, again, those mixed feelings come into play where if you look hard enough, there's a big flaw. I just did item casting for the last third of the game. Once I picked up enough items for all of my party members to just cast their respective equipment, that's what I did. Specifically, there is an OP sword that you can pick up that has an instant death mechanic, and it's an area effect. It does not work on bosses that I've tried it on, but it made it so every single random encounter was a pushover, and I just blindly mashed the A button or set myself up to auto-battle to use those abilities. Again, was it bad? No. Did it make the game that much more palatable and more enjoyable? Yes, to a point. Was I challenged? No, I was not challenged entirely. I chose to, again, delve into it and see if they did have a benefit. And yeah, quite often times I did lean on that. Sometimes I had to lean on it heavily in the end dungeons. As you'll see throughout the playthrough and out the Let's Plays that you'll see on any of the number of other channels that choose to cover this, I think that the game holds up pretty well for what it is. It's a turn-based RPG from Japan, JRPG. It's one of the first ones that was ever really released in the Americas, and one of the first ones that a lot of people from the 80s and early 90s cut their teeth on. And it paved the way for other versions of this game and other... Uh, now, is that going to make or break this franchise in any way shape or form absolutely not this is by no means the black sheep of the family this is not the most uh prolific one either so it's one of those middle of the pack final fantasy entries that i think everyone should play and enjoy because yeah there are a lot of areas for improvement there's a lot of areas for change and development there's no real narrative for the characters it's just this overarching restore the crystals of the four elements to their previous glory and then go fight the big bad evil guy it was a really fun jaunt down memory lane for me the only true times i've got challenged in this game in this version was when i fought tiamat the fiend of wind both times and I fought the end boss, because I had to really think about what my spells could do and what I could handle. And having something that late in the game really test my metal made it less enjoyable for the overall experience because someone who did not know what to expect could go into this thinking they had this based on previous interactions and leaning on those items, but on, without that ramping difficulty of a understanding, oh, I need to make sure I'm casting Protect, I need to make sure I'm casting Blink, I need to make sure I'm doing anti-death hits. It was really hard, or would be really hard for those newcomers to the game to understand. That said, this game is also very forgiving with an autosave feature. So if you happen to die at a fight, it takes you and autosaves you right at the entry of that room or those staircases into that level of the dungeon. So you could really easily rinse and repeat and try new things. Again, a quality of life improvement and a detriment to the game overall. I really hope you enjoy my thoughts on this game. They're a little bit rambling, but I wanted to do this kind of unscripted so that I could really get an organic uh, feel for this type of debunking difficulty and review. 
I recommend the game overall for anyone who's looking to try something from yesteryear in any form that they can get it on. This was an enjoyable romp down memory lane for me. And if you ever have the ideas that it was all rose colored glasses based on this game, it truly was not. The original NES game was very different and much more difficult. And if you have an opportunity to play that just to see the disparity and differences, I encourage you to try that as well, to give yourself a relevant point of history on where RPGs were and where they're going. Busy Gamer Dad, good luck, have fun.